to see you all this morning. Now, have you ever noticed that there's certain songs that you can either sing with or clap with, but you're going to have to make a choice? Man, I, 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 I was over off to the side, and I was singing. I was like, yes, and then I was clapping. I was like, no, and then I stopped, and I reversed it, and that was like worship 401 right there this morning, so praise the Lord for that. So this morning, we begin a brand new message series on prayer, and I want you to kind of hear my heart, and then I'm going to set up some things this morning. So as we get into this series, know that my heart is that we walk with Jesus in prayer, allowing his spirit to guide along the way. We all recognize that there's areas that God is growing us in in our faith and in our walk in prayer. And probably one of the worst things I could get up here and do is to beat you all to death with the word of God, trying to encourage you to pray. That doesn't exactly seem like it's going to work well. So what I'm praying is, God will allow us in many ways not to look at this as a standard Sunday morning prayer series as much as it is brothers and sisters in Christ getting together around the word and saying, how do we learn to pray more effectively? So here's a part of my story that leads into this. I have been a Christian for 28 years, and I have been a pastor for 23 of those years. The first part of my Christian journey was marked by what I knew and what I did. And what I mean by that is I wanted to know as much as possible so that I could serve God and please God and work for God and do the right things. And somewhere around 2004, God began to radically shift my view of what it looked like to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And during that time, he helped me to see it's not about me doing something for God. By the way, an omnipotent God, sovereign God, does not need you and I to work for him. We get a chance to join with him in what he's doing. But all he has to do is say now and whatever he desires can be done. The goal is not that we do something as much as that we are with him and that he does something through us. And when that truth began to take root in my heart, the word of God came alive again. Passages opened up, stories opened up, joy was restored. In many ways, it felt like I was being born again, again, if that makes any sense. There was a a joy that happened with that. 18 years later, and God is still teaching me what it looks like for him to live his life in and through me. But one of those pieces that is a constant part of my walk with God and a constant part that I'm asking him to help me understand is how do you frame the spiritual disciplines in a way in which it's not a to-do list as much as it is a journey to get to know him more. So I'm talking about things like studying the Bible. How, How do you move from checking it off your list, I read my Bible today, to engaging God in the word as you read. In your prayer time, how how do you move beyond, God, here's my list of everything I want you to do, to God, help me to know you as we sit together in prayer. How do you engage the disciplines of silence and service and meditation of scripture, solitude? How do you engage those in a way that practically speaking, You're getting to know God more in the process. That's been an ongoing piece that God has been working into my heart. How do I move from a list to do to a person to know? Now, for those of you who have gotten a chance to talk to me and we've spent some time together, you know, and I've shared openly, I love a good list. I love a list probably more than any person should love a list. I, I love checking things off. So this has been unbelievably challenging for me to move from a list into a relationship. And of the spiritual disciplines that I just mentioned a moment ago, by far the one that has been the most difficult in my life has been engaging God relationally in prayer. It has been hard for me, might be different for you, hard for me to move from God I need, God I want, 
God, here's my list, to God, I'm here, God, help me to know you, God, reveal yourself as we pray. That's a hard transition. It, th- again, it's me. Sometimes I feel as though my prayers are bothering God. It's almost like I don't want to come in at a wrong time. I feel like, God, I've brought this to you many times before, and, and I, don't, I don't want it to be bothersome. There, there's times that I feel like I am engaging in prayer and things are going real well, and then at other times I feel like almost everything I'm doing has been a monologue and not a dialogue. I'm not pausing and listening as he is speaking back and forth through prayer and through his word. It's just a process for me. So I want to be as open as I can possibly be with you all, sharing with you this is a journey in my life. I can tell you in 18 years of God taking me down this particular road that not only has he taught a lot of different truths about prayer, but there's certain truths that he has brought back on repeat. It just pops up again and again and again. This is not in your notes, but maybe it will resonate with where God has been teaching you. But Here's the top five things that God brings me back to again and again. First, God's call to prayer is constant in my life. Night and day, I can hear him call, come aside and pray. Night and day. There's not a, there's not a day that goes by that I cannot hear that call of God to sit alone with him in prayer. The second piece is my need for prayer is staggering. The older I get, the more clear it becomes that I am unbelievably dependent upon him. I am dependent upon him at every step. I'm dependent upon him to do in and through me what I cannot do for myself. I'm dependent upon him to help me stay close and clean before God. Every step, I'm dependent on him. A third one is my effectiveness in prayer ebbs and flows based on busyness. I'm going to give you a word. Here's a good word. Excessive busyness is death to a deeper prayer life. You cannot keep the road hot 24-7 and at the same time have a stillness of sitting alone with God and hearing as your Savior speaks into your heart. A fourth one that God constantly brings back is my selfishness with prayer is embarrassing. I'm amazed, apart from the Spirit's promptings, as to how much of my prayer time can be spent focused on things that impact only me. And here's number five. My understanding of prayer is still weak. There is a difference between knowledge and understanding. There's a difference between information and illumination of the Spirit that guides into a deeper time of prayer. Now, it's that last part to me that's still been puzzling to me over the years because I've read a lot of books on prayer and I've listened to a lot of messages on prayer. For that matter, I've preached a lot of messages on prayer. I have disciplined myself in the fact that I have certain times of the day that are scheduled times. I stop what I'm doing just to be alone, focused, dedicated time in prayer. I've learned to pray throughout the day where it's not just waiting for those couple of moments, but rather just journeying with God along the way. And I pray and I pray. And so in my mind, there's a lot of things that I feel like are going extremely well, and I'm like, we're making headway. And then there's those times that graciously, oh, listen, graciously, my Savior helps me see you're still asking the wrong questions. You're still seeking with selfish motives. You're still not trusting me in this area. And that's, that's what I love about walking with Jesus When he points it out, it's not condemning. He's calling you into deeper intimacy with him. The Bible says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So as we walk through these teachings, my prayer is our Savior graciously calls us to what that next step is. My prayer in this, my prayer for our church, is that God grows us in deep, intimate prayer. My, my prayer in this, and this is, this is me, my, my prayer is that we're not content 
with where we are in our prayer lives. That we don't talk a good prayer game and not be able to engage God on our knees. My, my prayer in this, and this is going to sound strange, I've asked God, God, be merciful to me as you're teaching lessons on prayer. That might sound strange, but here's the reason I beg for God's mercy. My prayer life goes up when crises and trials hit. So I'm praying, God, may it not have to be tragedy that causes me to learn the lesson I was too busy to listen to in calmness. So I'm just saying, God, have mercy on me. And he is merciful. He is gracious. He walks us through things. But a part of that is, God, help us get in line with what it is that he desires for our lives in prayer. Now, I know I've shared a lot just on the introduction of this, but I'm going to share a little bit more. We're just getting it all set up. And by the way, I'm not necessarily a hurry on this. Like, if Jesus comes back while we're here, that's good. I'm all right with that. You know, we just worship. We're talking about prayer. This is a great place. But anyway, one of those passages that God brings me back to in this topic is when the 12 disciples came up to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And the part that gets me is what it says afterwards. Jesus said, when you pray, and he just began to teach him. Now, here, here's, here's the reason that just stops me in my tracks. We read books on prayer. They were able to talk with the word made flesh. We look to prayer giants like Andrew Murray and George Mueller. They could reach out and touch second person of Trinity. And it said, they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said to them, when you pray. And there's a part in me that's almost like a jealousy. Like, God, I so would love to just sit there in that moment with you. But over the years, here's what God's taught me. We get something better. We get it recorded in his word. So whenever he sat with them and guided them through, because of the fact it's in the word, you and I are not left out of that meeting. We can also sit with the master and we can listen to him and learn from him and watch how it is that he's teaching. And I don't know about you, but my memory's not the best, so I love having it written in the word. I can go back and say, it's here. This is what Jesus is teaching his disciples on prayer. So here's where this series is going. All together, we're going to be doing multiple steps. I'm going to ask if you all would put the series graphic back up on the screen for just a moment, if you could. There is a piece, Jesus on prayer. But you'll notice around this ring, there's multiple other pieces, leadership, discipleship, time, emotions, you name it. My heart in this series, it'll probably take us four to five years to walk through. But my heart in this is if we're out reading other books and we don't sit with our Savior on these topics, we're missing it. So I want us to sit with Jesus and say, before I run to a book, Jesus, teach me on prayer. When it comes to leadership, I, I don't want to read 50 other leadership books when the preeminent leader the world's ever seen gave a, a, a clinic on leadership in the Word. I want to sit with our, our Savior in that. So we're going to rotate through this, and we'll, we'll take it over time. But we start with prayer. And in this, we, we start by talking about these different topics. So, for example, we're going to be teaching through what Jesus shared with his disciples on secret prayer, persistent prayer, believing prayer, forgiving prayer, and authoritative prayer but we're going to start with model prayer this morning. I invite you, if you're not already there, because a lot of people get your notes and I can walk up to you and you've already got your page open and some of you are filling out the fill in the blanks already. That's a good word right there. Anyway, so go with me in your Bibles. Matthew's Gospel chapter number 6 will be in verses 9 through 12. So as you find your place in that text, I'm going to be speaking this morning on model prayer. And I'm going to read the Matthew passage. I'll share a few thoughts. And then we're going to go to another very similar passage over in Luke chapter 11. But let's begin with Matthew chapter 6. We'll be in verses 9 through 13. This is Jesus speaking. Pray then 
in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive, have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we join with the original 12 disciples in their request this morning. Lord, teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago, I was having lunch with a friend of mine, and we were talking about prayer and talking about what God was doing in relation to prayer within the church. And this friend of mine made the statement. He said, when Christians are praying, it's hard to mess that up. And when he said it, I smiled and shook my head in agreement. But afterwards, I walked away and I started thinking, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. If the question is, do you pray or not pray, then always pray. Like, that's, that's an easy one right there. But if you're talking about the difference between engaging in prayer and effectiveness in prayer, that's not exactly a foolproof activity. In fact, in previous verses, if you were to look up in chapter 6, Jesus gave some other very specific instructions. In verse number 5, he says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. According to Jesus, hypocrisy in prayer are not conducive. He says in verse number 7, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition. Uh, based on what that's saying, saying the same stuff over and over without thought to what we're saying, that's not what God is desiring in our prayer life. In verse number 9, Jesus said, pray then in this way. In other words, there is a way you don't want to pray, and then there is a way that I want you to pray. So while my intention in this is never to discourage people from praying, I do want to be as clear as I can that there's a difference between you and I talking to God and talking with God. I think all of us want our prayers to be effective. And probably about the only thing worse than ineffective prayers is ineffective prayers and you don't know why they're ineffective. If we don't know what we're doing wrong, we just keep doing the same things over and over again. So that being said, I now want you to turn over to Luke's gospel chapter number 11 for just a moment. Luke's gospel chapter 11, we'll be in verses 1 through 4 here. Now, as you find your place in the text, just know that this particular story where we're dropping into Luke chapter 11, it takes place about a year later. The disciples had walked with Jesus. They had ministered with Jesus. They had even been sent out by Jesus. They had seen some big, amazing, miraculous things. They had seen Jesus walk on water. They'd seen him cast demons out of people, heal people. They, they had seen Jesus do incredible things, but they also got a chance to witness the pattern of his prayer life. And that is they would watch him pull away from the crowds, go to a deserted place and pray alone with the Father, and then come back out and minister out of what the, the Father had directed him to in prayer. And they noticed that as that happened, there were huge things that were going on, like, like Jesus was doing stuff that they had never seen before. And they're recognizing that, and they're saying, I want what he's got in prayer. So look at what it says in verse number 1. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. Now, keep in mind, these are Jewish disciples for the most part. These are guys who were not novices in prayer. They had prayed from their childhood moving forward. This, this is not their first rodeo, and yet there is a humility in the way they're coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, teach us to pray. Notice what he says. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. It's the same basic prayer that he's already mentioned over in the Sermon on the Mount. 
And Jesus is providing a pattern for prayer. So here's the pattern. What's the pattern that we're finding here? In both examples, the emphasis is placed on God's interest and not ours. It reveres God's name, it seeks God's kingdom, and it desires God's will. Effective prayers are God-centered. Robert Law once said, prayer is a mighty instrument, not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will done on earth. It's also worth noting that there are no singular pronouns that are mentioned in either of these prayers. They're all plural. That is, it speaks of our Father, our daily bread, our debts, and our debtors. The requests are give us, forgive us, lead us, and deliver us. It's all plural. It's not just me, it's plural. Now, if you were to stop right there, you can automatically see a dramatic difference in the pattern of prayer as taught by Christ and what most of us experience in our prayer time. So much of our prayer comes back to me. So much of our prayer is, God, bless me. God, take care of my finances. God, bless my health. God, encourage me. God, meet me. And, and listen, there's a lot that we can look at in Scripture. For example, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. The issue is not... Do you bring personal needs to God in prayer? The issue that happens is sometimes our prayers can become so self-focused that we miss God in his interest, in his kingdom, in his will, and we miss what's going on in the lives of those that are around us. That, that's our key concept I want us to focus on for just a moment. Our prayers are more effective when we think God first, others second, and me third. God first, others second, me third. Now, again, nothing wrong with praying for personal needs. The issue is one of priority and the ease at which our prayer lives can become so me-focused that they become ineffective. When our mentality is, God, take care of me, and if I've got any time left, I'll pray about your kingdom and I'll pray for the needs of others, there's a selfishness that's coming out in our prayer time. The pattern of model prayer, it resembles that of the two great commandments. Love God completely, love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew chapter 22. Now somebody might say, but if I'm focused on God's interest and I'm focused on praying for others, who's praying for me? Who, who's handling my business? Listen, God is. God is. Did you know in Matthew 6, 8, it says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Let, let this thought sink in. Before you wake up tomorrow morning and know the first problem that you're going to face, your heavenly father already knows and is already working the scene. Do you recognize that there is so much in prayer? It's not about us informing God of our needs as much as it is recognizing what God already knows and seeking to walk as he directs. If you go further in Matthew 6, 25 through 33, Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about the necessities of life. And he says, your father already knows what you need. And, and if he's caring for the, the beast of the field and caring for the flowers of the field, he'll care for you. There's such comfort for us in knowing that our father already knows. Now, over the years, this has been one of my struggles. I, you all might be different. I'm speaking for myself. If I know a problem's hitting my life, my prayer over that problem goes up. If I know a problem's hitting someone else's life, sometimes it's like, I'll get to that later. I, I don't mean that to sound judgmental or mean. I'm just trying to be honest. I'm just trying to say, when you, when you feel the pressure of it, it's easier to pray. So in this Here's the piece God has to keep bringing me back to. When, I, when he prompts me of selfishness that's coming into my prayers, here's what he reminds me of. Romans 8.26 tells us the Spirit intercedes for us when we don't even know what to pray for. Hebrews 7.25 says Jesus lives always to make intercession for the saints. 
And now Matthew 6, 8 says, our heavenly Father already knows our needs. So I don't have to spend 90% of my prayer time begging God for my needs because my heavenly Father already knows. My Savior is already praying, and the Spirit of God is interceding in a way that I don't even know what to ask for in that moment. Now, because of those truths, here's what God reminds me of. I need to stop acting like a spiritual orphan who doesn't have a daddy who cares. My father cares. I have to stop worrying as if somehow my circumstances have taken him by surprise. And if I can't slip into the the throne room fast, then somehow he's going to be taken back and he doesn't have time to respond as I need him to. The Son of God and the Spirit of God have been interceding long before I even knew the problem existed. We don't have to offer prayers that reek of selfishness. When we pray, think God first, others second, me third. Now, for that to happen, we have to be in a place that we get outside of thinking our will and we start thinking a whole lot more of God's will. What does that look like? How how does that naturally happen? I'm going to share this is how God prompts me in that area. It might be something that will help you. The first part of me getting outside of praying for myself and praying according to God's will is make the goal of your life to know God. The more you get to know him, the more you love him. The more you love him, the more you love what he desires. If you want to start praying in accordance with God's desires, make the goal of your life to know him. A second one there is keep submitting everything to God. Submission is a mark of humility and a declaration of dependence upon God. And here's the third one. Pray as he prompts. Trust that the Spirit of God can lead you to pray in accordance with the Father's will. So let me pause here for just a moment. God has a way of teaching lessons when I'm preparing messages. So many of you saw this last week on social media. I had a a wonderful opportunity to go to a little lakeside cabin, get away for some time of prayer and reflection and writing in this last week. And so as the evening would come after dinner, I was going out on this little lake. There was a canoe there, and I would row out onto the lake. I took a little fishing rod with me, and I sat there and just resting at the end of the day and reflecting over the things that God was teaching. And at the same time, threw out a little line to see if I could catch a fish or two. Now, I don't know if you all have done a lot of fishing, but um, resting and reflecting are not always connected with fishing. So fishing has two cousins that come. One is swearing, and the other one stress a lot of times. So I'm sitting out there in this little canoe, and the two cousins really wanted to join me on one particular evening. And the issue was I'm trying to row out to where I wanted to be, and the wind kept blowing me somewhere else. And I'd row back out, and the wind kept blowing me somewhere else, and I was fighting with this. And then all of a sudden, this thought came to mind. Go where the Spirit or where the wind blows and fish there. And I just stopped, and I found myself in the weeds on the shore. It didn't seem like it was conducive to fishing. I caught just as many fish there. And listen, and I used half the strength to get there. So here's what God, in that moment, God has a way of taking the simple pieces in life and teaching valuable eternal lessons. Here's what he taught me in that moment. Paul, you keep trying to structure everything in your prayer time. Go where the Spirit leads and pray there. How many times, and this is one that I've been walking through, how many times has it been that you've got your prayer list And you're praying, and all of a sudden you keep getting distracted with all these other things keep popping in your head. And then you get mad, and you're like, God, help me to stay on the list. Help me to stay on the list. Hey, I wonder if God, I wonder if God is leading you off the list to pray over the things that are happening in the moment, the things that are close in his heart. Now, as a guy who loves a list, I don't like the idea of being taken off my list. I find comfort in my list. 
But there's so many times that I'm praying and all of a sudden somebody's name pops to mind. And all of a sudden I start to pray, God, how do I intercede for that person? And I'll begin to pray for them. And then there's a passage that comes to mind. And that passage connects with what God was teaching me two days ago over here. And all of a sudden, what seems like a distraction is not a distraction. It's walking in the Spirit of God. <laughs> Listen, all of a sudden, when you begin to see God answer prayer requests that were not on your list, it almost makes you want to say, maybe I don't need the list. Oh, you all don't, you don't know how hard that is for that to come out of my mouth. My thing is, if I don't have some structure around me, I just wander sometimes. I, I need to know. I need to know when somebody comes and says, Paul, would you pray for me on this? I don't want to see the person the next Sunday and then quickly say, Lord, bless them fast. And then say, brother, I was praying for you this last week. I, I want to be able to, when they say, would you pray for me, either to stop in the moment and pray or also to write it down and know that that next week I'm praying for them. I, I need a list for that. But there's also beauty in walking with the Spirit and praying as he prompts along the way. So here's the next piece. I, I'm going to close out by just sharing that there's ways that selfishness comes back in, but I'm going to give you three ways that self sneaks back into our prayer time and moves us off of God first, others second, me third. So the first of those would be what I would call short-sighted prayers. These are prayers that place our comfort at the center of God's activity in the world. So some examples of this would be God, help my washing machine start working because I don't want to call the repair guy. God, would you keep the rain away on Saturday because I've got a party outside? God, please clear this wreck because I really want to get home. Now, now you got to hear my heart in this. You got to hear my heart. Nothing wrong with praying for personal needs. Nothing wrong with praying over everything. But here's how something can become short-sighted. Perhaps the repair guy is on the other side praying for work to keep food on the table for his family. In that moment, an inconvenience for you is God's provision and answer to prayer for them. There might be more going on than just your washing machine breaking. I don't know if you all know this or not, but my mom and my grandparents would always say, like, they don't make them like they used to. Like, you, you would get a washing machine back then, 70 years later, that bad boy's still running. Uh, if you get more than about five years out of one right now, you're blessed. So maybe God's using that for our sanctification in our prayer time. Uh, here's one. Perhaps the farmers need rain to keep their crops alive. Would you be willing for there to be rain on your party on, on a Saturday if it means that they're able to keep their crops? Or here's another one. Perhaps the reason God has you at that wreck is because he wanted a believer there to intercede for somebody who got majorly injured or maybe somebody who's about to slip out into eternity apart from knowing him. And he placed you there as a believer to intercede in that moment. See, sometimes our, our prayers can be short-sighted. We, we think, God, this is uncomfortable for me, not necessarily, God, what are you doing in this moment that I can't see? Another one to be self-motivated prayers. These prayers confuse selfish desires with concerns for others. Now, some of the examples would be, God, would you give my kids a job in town? Like, their life is here, their family is here. They need to be next to their grandparents. Please provide a job here so that they don't have to go there. Or, God, would you help my wife to get over her sickness so that we don't have to cancel our vacation? Okay. In those examples... It may seem like you're praying for someone else, but you're actually praying for yourself through someone else. So what if God's will for your kids is that they move to Seattle, Washington? Because he wants them to be in a new community, to be salt and life, to stretch their faith, allowing them to be a part of a church so that they live out in a city without as much of a church influence what it is that they learned here. What if that's God's will for them? Would you rather they be in God's will or would you rather keep your plan of togetherness? I know i got to watch out now. <laughs> Listen, 
Every time I preach on this, I'm over here thinking, I got two godly daughters. And what if God were to say, I want you to be a missionary somewhere around the world in a difficult area. Will I, as their earthly father, be as excited about them being in the will of their heavenly father? There's a lot in this. And remember, that's why, that's why we have to keep coming before God and saying, God, I can't, but you can through me. I don't even want to pray this, but I know I need to pray this. Like there, there's so much that we're depending on him with. Here's the last one. Manipulative prayers. Not all prayers are directed towards God. Sometimes we pray at others out loud. So a couple of examples. Um, praying that God would supply the $1,000 you need to fix your car, but you pray that in front of your richest relative. <laughs> that might just be high-level begging going on. Um, praying that God would silence critical speech in front of the people who have been critically talking about you might be a cowardly way of giving a backhand in prayer. Praying for your desperate need for a night out away from your kids in front of a person who has a heart to serve people might be a way of scoring some free babysitting. Okay? Got quiet in here on that one. Everybody was all on that $1,000 for car repair. Not as much on this one. But anyway, prayer can be a way of manipulating people to do what we would have them to do. That's very opposite of God first, others second, and me third. So whether it's short-sighted or self-motivated or manipulative prayer, self is at the center. Now, you might say, is it that bad? Oh, it is bad. Write this passage off to the side, James 4, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Our prayers are ineffective when our goals are selfish. So here's your homework as we close out. First, I want to encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to prompt you every time your prayers turn selfish. Now remember, there's nothing wrong with praying for personal needs. But you will notice that there's an issue when selfishness is now masquerading as legitimate needs. When the Holy Spirit prompts you, that's selfish. Don't argue. Just agree. Repent. And ask God, would you teach me what it looks like to pray God first, others second, me third. Now here's the next one. Ask God to use this message series to revive, enhance, and strengthen each person's prayer life. Pray that these truths sink in. I've been a pastor 23 years. Apart from the Spirit of God activating truths in the hearts of believers, we will spend the next six to seven weeks hearing teaching on prayer, and it won't change anything. My prayer is God changes. May we engage prayer at a deeper level, a more intimate level, a spirit-led level. May we not just go through the motions. May we be effective as we pray. My prayer is that God would stir such a passion and our hearts for prayer, that we just begin to see answer after answer. We, we share stories of this is what God's teaching me, and here's what I just learned this last week. I'm praying that prayer becomes that ethos within the room, that we're, we're able to sit and to discuss how God is guiding and leading in prayer. I began the message talking about how God has been transitioning my life from workspace righteousness into this way of walking in relationship where he lives his life in and through me. Every bit of what I'm describing in this series, it comes back to a person who has an intimate relationship with God. If it's going to be him living through you, he first has to be in you. Something I've shared over and over is everything God desires to do in your life and an enhanced prayer life is a part of that. He will accomplish out of the overflow of your relationship with him.
It all comes out of this relationship. So as we close, do you know that you have that relationship? If you were to close your eyes in death tonight, would you open your eyes in heaven right afterwards? It might be that that you know you have the relationship, but you know that there's things that are stifling the Spirit of God in your heart in moving forward. I said earlier that excessive busyness is death to depth of prayer. Let me also say ongoing lingering sin will kill your prayer life as well. It might be that we're just saying, God, just start fresh in me today. May I I not just talk a good prayer game, may I live a life of prayer. It might be that you're just saying, God, like the disciples, teach me to pray. Sometimes teach me to unlearn what I've learned that was not of you. And teach me to pray in accordance with your desires. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow with me for a moment of prayer. Our band will be coming forward. Our pastors will be stepping out into the middle of the aisles. There will be some of the pastor's wives that are joining some of the pastors. As we're going into this time of invitation, my encouragement to you, Simply let the Spirit of God lead you. Don't walk through this series over the next six to seven weeks and just say, I learned more information about prayer. May it be that God changes our prayer lives. So it might be that you need to talk with a pastor today and say, I'm not sure about whether or not I have a relationship with God. Make today the day that you take care of that peace. It might be that you just need somebody to pray with you and say, Like you've gone through some difficult stuff and you don't even know how to engage God in prayer at this point and you would just need somebody to pray for you. It might be that God has revealed that there's certain things in your life that are stifling your growth in prayer. Take care of those things this morning. There's going to be some people, they would feel comfortable coming forward and talking with a pastor or kneeling at the altar. Others are saying, I'm not ready for that. But you can do business with God right where you're at as well. Just Let the Spirit of God lead you as He desires. Heavenly Father, apart from Your Spirit guiding us in prayer, God, we will have a lot of information that does not move to illumination and action. So Lord, teach us to pray. May our hearts be bent towards prayer. May there be a holy discontent in the current state of our prayer life. May there be a humility in our hearts to learn what you say in your word when it comes to prayer. And God, may we walk in effective prayer. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?
So take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to see at your feet. I'm caught up. Father seems to know exactly what we need when we need it. And we thank him because he sends us a word right when the time we we're about to get super busy for summer. We've already made out our vacation plans, our schedules, and we said, I'm going to pack this next few months with as much as I can get in it as I can. I'm going to make up for stuff I haven't done in the past two years. But at this juncture in our life, God says, wait a minute. What's more important is spending time with me. So we thank God for his word today. We thank God for how he continues to speak to us collectively and individually. Amen? So as we prepare to close out today's service, maybe you're here in this room or you're watching online and you're asking yourself, okay, God, I hear you. What are the next steps to that? So we would love to meet you right out in the atrium. We have a next step desk out in the atrium. If you're new here, we thank you. We would love for you to come out there as well and say, okay, what, what, what am I supposed to do with this? How, how am I supposed to get along with God? What does that even look like in my life? We have some pastors that would love to talk to you. And so if you're watching online, thank you so much. God bless you. We'll see you next week. But if you're here in the room, we want to 